very happy to have with me today Ian Pringle, um, author, historian, um, celebrated aviator, um, man who formed Thunder City where, where um, Ian flew buccaneers and hawker hunters. But um, we'll talk about the books later. Um, before we get there, I want um, Ian to talk about uh, the Peace Reserve Air Wing, which really was where um, you cut your teeth as a as a flyer, I think. Um, and uh, it's 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 a uh, it's an amazing story about um, an amazing bunch of people who were really all reservists and um, all using their own equipment for a, for a common cause. So it's not a phenomenon that happens in in many wars. But it certainly was um, a very important cog in the in the military and and flying machine of of the Rhodesian Defence Forces. So um, a really interesting um, subject. And uh, Ian, thanks for thanks for uh, being here. Um, I wonder if, if we could just start off with you just talking about the air wing in general. Um, how how it came oh. to be and, and um, what the functions were of the Peace Reserve Air Wing. Yeah, um, I just put a, um, a little cautionary note in there. I only joined it when the war was in full swing in, in the mid 70s. Um, but it was set up, um, most police, uh, police forces around the world have um, professional um, pilots flying police aircraft. And uh, of course, Rhodesia was very unique in that sense because it um, invited reservists to bring their own planes in and do, originally it would be um, things like um, finding someone, I think Aidan Diggin, Diggin, a great um, escapee from prisons. Um, he was tracked down using police air wing aircraft, helping people on the ground and so on. Um, and it did that for a long time. When hostility started, um, it, it became more of a transport wing, um, moving senior officers, uh, police officers, that is, around to police stations in remote areas like Mukumbura or Kanyemba, all over the place. And um, it sort of expanded. It also did some tell staff for the army, you know, the radio relays um, and uh, reconnaissance. It started taking over more of a of a direct um, role in reconnaissance to let the Air Force carry on doing what the Air Force was very good at. So that's where it sort of evolved from. When I came into it, um, I did the same thing, carried people around um, on the ferry to various places. Then ultimately they moved um, a number of us, mainly younger people, into a dedicated flight called Salops. And we did only the armed work. Um, you know, the aircraft were armed with uh, machine guns and later on with, um, with uh, um, anti-personnel bombs. That's sort of the, the, the broad picture. <clears throat> Ian, what, what sort of aircraft did you fly for most of the time and what were you actually equipped with and what were you tasked with doing? Um, the ones that we, when we flew the armed aircraft, they were usually always Cessna. So you do the um, side firing out the left with a, with a pilot sat. So in a typical Cessna 206, you have the, the door off um, on the left-hand side, the MAG, MAG or Browning. Most of the people preferred, most of the pilots preferred Brownings, firing um, side out, sort of like a G-car, the same thing, 800 feet orbit. And then later on, they put um, bombs that were mounted on the strut. Um, they were two anti-personnel bombs that you could drop straight and level. Not greatly affected, but they certainly made a lot of noise. But generally, it was it was the guns um, that we used. So, just explain the setup. Um, what sort of what sort of weaponry? Um, how did you actually manage to drop those bombs? Did you was it was it a manual affair? Um, who was who, yeah. who was helping you in the aircraft? Um, we always had an observer. Um, he would man the gun and also do the, um, the arming of the bombs and then the dropping. He had a sight mounted on the side of the aircraft. And that would be a straight and level episode going in at 1,500 feet, of course, like a sitting duck, but um, and then release them in straight and level based on a calibrated sight that would work on the throw forward. And um, that's, that's what it was. 
Um, but most of us, as I say, um, and personally, I eventually stopped. I, I preferred not to carry the bombs because you were far more effective in an orbit where you had the, um, the target um, visual the whole time, whereas in the bombing run, um, the, the observer would have it uh, visual, but the pilot wouldn't. So it, it wasn't great, especially if you had to come around again and drop the other one. Uh, tell us about some of the operations that you were involved in and um, yeah, some of the, some of what actually happened um, in your case. Yeah, we'd, we'd, uh, because we're based at, uh, not always, but at Charles Prince Airport, we tended to do a lot of ops just northeast of Salisbury, also um, also to the, the, the west occasionally, but mainly in the uh, Chikwakwa, that area to the northeast of Enterprise. Um, is where there was a massive zonal incursion in that area. And um, we would be called out to assist. Initially, it was police units, sometimes even motorcycle, you know, the trail bike guys uh, from the um, party going out, and we would um, help them from the air and provide air cover, what, what we could do. But often, and what happened a lot from about 78 through to the end of the war was, when the fire force, or not the fire force, but the uh, Rhodesian Air Force were going on external raids, Operation Dingo, many, many others, Snoopy, Gatling, all of them, um, there was no fire force. So we became um, a poor man's fire force. We got calls from people who would normally call the fire force and have a deployment. And all we could do is go over and try and help as much as we can, certainly lay down fire for them and, and also um, move troops. Um, not not in the sweep and stop way that um, RLI would do, for example, but whatever we had on the ground. So we, you know, try to get troops to, um, you know, be successful uh, making contact with the enemy. But it was it was very much a poor man's fire force. And that during those external ops, um, we were flying three, four sorties a day and often running out of ammo on the sortie. Um, and we took lots of small arms hits, but luckily never anything heavier fired at us. Were any of the of the police reserve guys actually shot down? Only one, no, no planes went down. Some of us had very hairy moments, um, nearly went down. Um, and we only lost one person who took a, um, an AK-47 round right in the forehead, but that was the only casualty I can remember. Was that a pilot who got hit? No, he was actually the observer. He was on the gun. Tell us about some of your more intense... Uh, contact situations uh, that, that you came through? Yeah, and the, um, probably the one I remember most is when um, we were doing a combined operation with, um, or combined operation, when I use that in a very small term, one gunship early morning attack on us, I suppose, um, in a base camp. And uh, the police guys would move in, we'd stay out of range of, of sound and then move in with them when the, when the sun came up. And they didn't have the target in the right place. So um, I went off, uh, my gunner and I, Neville Pinky, we went off to a, um, another spot, orbited, and that's where the enemy were. So we came under massive fire from the enemy. And I took a hit in the um, aileron cable and also one in the elevator cable, not knowing it because the elevator was first and I just felt it go very slack. And um, the aileron I didn't really notice, just that it was very, getting also very slack on the aileron. So we carried on firing away, you know, like brave young people do. Not brave, silly young people do, until we are relieved by Buster Brown and his crew. Um, so that's probably the worst. Got the plane down with a hell of a bang because there was very little. I had to use a lot of trim to actually land the aircraft. But that's probably the most hairy. Um, a number of the guys had bullets whizz past their heads. And we had armored seats. Um, short seats that number of guys took um, bullets in those there was some something about the human being you just don't want to be shot around that area um, <laughs> so the seat gave you some sort of protection that's not surprising Ian were you yeah. used on any of the external operations uh, either as Telstar or in any in any role at all Done, done Telstar out of uh, Matoko before, but never, never crossed the, the border. Some of the guys did occasionally by um, going to drop a, um, a special, usually special branch or someone uh, in, from a parachute just at a low. Um, but that was very, very rare. Most of it was within the country. And as I say, doing, doing support. Yeah, okay. Let's just uh, talk about, um, about your books. 
Um, start with, I've got it here. Uh, this, uh, this was your first one, I think, Optingo. Um, yes, that was the first one. Yeah. Which is, which is the, the big raid into uh, Shamoyo. Um, yeah. Just tell us about why you wrote, why you wanted to write and uh, what you wrote about. Um, as I said, I was flying uh, um, for Pro, so I had nothing to do with Operation Dingo, but I knew a lot of people who'd been on it, and I just thought it was one of those David versus, versus Goliath um, attacks that I, I just marveled at it so much talking to the people afterwards. So eventually I decided to write a book about it. Not there's, I don't appear in the book at all, which is nice because then it's not, there's no autobiography in there. And I got huge help from so many people, from Peter Peter Boyer to um, Brian Robertson. Um, normally he wouldn't speak to anyone, but we had a series of discussions in little bits. Um, so uh, I managed to get through that. Then I put the story together, doing a lot of research, also doing research on the Zanla side, what they're mm -hmm. up to and why, et cetera and the political backdrop, um, which I found fascinating. And the battle itself, of course, was, you know, less than 200 um, airborne uh, troops, SAS and RLI, versus anything up to 5,000 on the ground, which was bold um, because it used virtually the entire Air Force. So if it gone badly wrong, the Rhodesian Air Force would have been reduced to, to nothing. And of course, everyone going in by air, there was another fascinating thing. They all had to be brought out by helicopter. So again, see that that could go horribly wrong. And the fact that it was such a success just makes it an amazing story. And it is the, uh, it's the large, it was the largest battle of the Rhodesian Bush War. Yeah, and um, I, mean, I think you're probably a better historian than I am, but I don't know where else in military history you'll have those figures, those statistics, that um, few number of people taking on a, a defensive position and a well defense, well defended um, yeah, position. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, that's right. Virtually every aircraft over the target was hit in some form or another at some stage. No, no one went down. I mean, Norman Walsh nearly went down. He was commanding the air effort and they, they took a 20 mil through um, right up near the, the rotor head, but he managed to limp back to the base camp. So, yeah, it was very, very hairy for the, for the air guys as well. And extremely well planned. Uh, Brian yeah. Robinson and Norman Walsh obviously did an incredibly good job of planning that operation. Um, yeah, and to uh, the timing, of the timing of the air attacks. You know, within you know, you'd be there at eight and um, zero eight hundred hours, not zero eight zero one. Um, exactly, because the sequence of attacks. You know, when the hunters went in, and then the Canberras were just about in. The hunters would re-strike um, all that precision and then the helicopters and the Dakotas arriving all at exactly the right time. It was amazing. It was amazing. I'm not sure where you'll find this type of um, battle to, to uh, for that degree of um, accuracy and timing. Yeah, and what did the Air Force lose there in the end? One of the vampires went down. Didn't yeah, a vampire took around and... Um, it it uh, it was crippled and it tried to do uh, the, the pilot tried to do a forced landing um, near Nyanga, um, but unfortunately it was a ditch in the field. It was a good forced landing, but hit the ditch and of course went over and it crushed the front. As a vampire is quite a, a weak aircraft for that, uh, you know, for going into a crash anyway. And one of the helicopters, um, it was one of the, it was Mark McLean, I think, yes. who crash. Uh, he was shot, shot, in the, shot in the head, wasn't he? A concussed and crashed his helicopter. There was a story. Yeah, he, he was orbiting and um, he took a, a round right through the, the helmet. In fact, in the book, there's a picture of him many years later when I interviewed him. Um, and he pulled a, 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 a string or a, I think it was a chopstick. I'm not sure. Um, to show the, the line of the bullet. And it actually bashed him on the side of the, the head left a nice big lump on it. Um, and uh, and he went a bit dulali at first and then sort of regained his senses and carried on flying. Scared the daylights out of his gunner, of course, who thought he was gone. And, you know, you're sitting back there. It's not, not easy to grab a collective and a cyclic um, in a flash. So um, just as well, Mark came around and um, sort of then they left the target. An amazing story. So he did actually recover the chopper? Mark. He recovered the chopper, um, yeah. Luckily. Ian, um, I've got your other book here. Uh, 
Green Leader, the Op Gatling story, um, which I also found fascinating. But uh, you tell us a bit more about it. Did you spend quite a bit of time with Chris Dixon um, going over it? Uh, did the guys that you spoke to? Yeah, I spent um, a lot of time with uh, with most the, um, quite a few of the Hunter pilots and some of the Canberra pilots, of course, on that because uh, the first phase of Operation Gatling was an attack on the Zipra headquarters just outside Lusaka. Um, that was the main first leg of the attack. It was actually three attacks and um, two in other parts within Zambia. But the first one was an air effort only. And um, I didn't get a chance to speak to Chris because he had passed on when I was actually writing the book. So okay. unfortunately, but I spoke to his brother, which was also very helpful with them. Um, because in these books, I try to describe the personalities, not just the battle. Um, I tried to, so I could, you know, I could talk about how they built a farm from mud and we, you know, went to Norton Junior School and things like that to build mm -hmm. up. But I spoke to um, quite a few of the pilots on various, um, and even the, there were four K cars went in, the helicopter K cars. And um, I spoke to one of those pilots. Um, and uh, it, again, a fascinating story of timing, of just being absolutely ballsy about it, you know, going right into the capital or right adjacent to a capital in a foreign country with a foreign air force and, and missiles defending camps, etc. But like Dingo, it was um, a complete surprise attack and that was where the strength of the attack lay was in surprise um, but a fascinating story again with hunters going in first although the recording a green leader there's a myth that that's actually um, just before the attack that recording was done actually after the cameras had gone through and the hunters were striking again but it was the typical thing four hunters going in of um, blue section this time uh, one after each other in the high dive, the high silent dive, in other words, engines on idle, down they'd go, um, steep dive. The four hunters would go through shortly after the last one had gone through, in came the Canberras, because it was very, very, it was necessary, obviously, to get the, to get the anti-personnel bombs from the Canberras in before people scattered too far. And of course, they got them on, the, on a parade square. Um, so again, with the timing, um, it was just phenomenal. And the, the, only an air attack it, it created and in, you know it was hugely successful for simply an air effort with nobody on the ground. What were the other targets? Was... Um, the other targets were Makushi which was um, further southwest um, and that was a very large camp and also what they called CGT which is a series of camps much closer to the Rhodesian border. Um, and those were, those were, you know, the op, um, Zulu, um, phase one was the Lusaka attack and that was at eight o'clock and then they went on. The next one was 11.30 and the last one was late in the afternoon. And that was rearming, getting people ready um, to go into the two attacks because um, the ground forces were used in both Makushi and CGT. Yes, that's right. Um, um, and Ian, I don't have a copy of it, but, but your third book, um, and I haven't read it, so you, you need to tell tell us what it's yeah, about. Yeah, it's called it's called Murder in the Zambezi, and it really arose from um, Gatling. You know, the the um, Operation Gatling Green Leader story, which I cover the Viscount, uh, the first Viscount shot down um, the Hunyani, um, which, in a way, well, in fact, it did provoke the attacks that formed Gatling. Um, because there were negotiations going on between Ian Smith and Josh Nkoma just days before the Viscount was shot down. So ultimately that attack would have happened, but it was this that, um, that provoked it. And I had a number of families actually asked me, they said, can you tell the story without the military aspect, you know, about people we lost, about how we felt and how and as much information as I could get. So again, it's very much, it's a sad story, of course, but it's very much about the people involved, survivors, um, as much as I could get on on people that, and I, I, I focused on on families of the first one, uh, the first the, the Hunyani um, account where there were survivors, and then later on the Mnyadi account where there were no survivors. So I covered both my accounts as well um, um, in 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 a lot of detail. So it was really a, a family prompted thing that made me write that one. But there's hardly any military in it other than the essential. Um, stuff that you you know needed to tell the story. 
Yeah, and um, we're going into prickly country, but um, I've spoken about it before on the series. I mentioned this book by Jeffrey Alp. I don't know if you've read it, um, where he... Okay, he puts forward um, a theory about um, the fact that maybe these planes were sabotaged. The more I've spoken to people and listened since that time, the more convinced I am that these aircraft were shot down by missiles. But what is what is your take on on this whole issue? It can be a thorny issue, Hannes, as a North, you know, you don't really want to, um, <clears throat> to be too critical of other authors' work. And what he did in that story was exceptionally well-researched um, stuff on the SAM-7, you know, the, the, uh, the Grail or the Estrella. Um, he did enormous research on it, and, and it, it's probably a very good document to have. But unfortunately to me, um, the, the positions of the planes, where they were and where they were hit and the altitude didn't correlate. So um, that for me was where I would um, <clears throat> go along with it. You know, it, it was a missile attack. It was a surface to air missile. I have no doubts about that. And people, and I've interviewed a lot of people um, around the whole thing and nothing was left um, the possibilities. Even timing, for example, the second Viscount was late. So, um, and also it, it did not, as many people say, turn straight for home. It left low level and flew on a, a completely random route. And it's only when it pulled up a long, long way away towards Karoi that it was shot down at quite low level. And again, that, that aircraft, um, um, that Viscount going down had the, an eyewitness or three eyewitnesses. Um, and I interviewed one of them. Um, so that was unique about that as well. And nothing indicates it was sabotage. After after the war, uh, you went abroad, but um, just tell us a little bit about about Thunder City. Uh, I know we, we we're talking about more recent times, but I think it's a, a lot of interest to people. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was um, you know while I was doing all this, it was all part time. Well, I had a commercial. Um, pilot's license for fast jets and also for helicopters. I was always in business. I had to have a good career to afford this. So what happened is um, when I was in the UK uh, based there, they started selling off extra Air Force Hunters. And I got into a syndicate and started learning to fly um, fast jets. Meanwhile, I didn't even know the guy. Mike Beachy Head in Cape Town had done the same thing. He had gone there. Well, I think he was watching rugby in Cape Town. And he went on the phone and... Um, bought some hunters um, and a Canberra actually on, on auction. Um, never seen them before, but he bought them on auction. So that was happening before I had learned, and we didn't know about each other. And then eventually um, I was managed, uh, very luckily managed to get early retirement. So I came down to Cape Town and a mutual friend uh, introduced us. And of course we sort of liked each other. So I brought a hunter and a buccaneer into the fleet and we already had um, buccaneers, lightnings, and hunters in the fleet. So Mike was the Mike was the brain, the, the, the whole creator of Thunder City. But it was just lovely being part of it and being a, a partner in the business. And of course, what we what we were really doing is doing some very expensive flying, uh, which was free to us. We didn't make any money out of it, but it was very, very an expensive operation to run. But Typically, you'd pay 9,000 euros for a flight in a, in a Lightning or 7,000 euros for a flight in a Buccaneer. And it sounds outlandish, but that's what people were willing to pay. And that's what we needed to cover all the engineering and, and um, cost. Because these are warbirds, you know, nuclear bomber like a, um, a Buccaneer, supersonic interceptor like the Lightning and the Hunter. We, you know, very need a lot of TLC. Mm. So, yeah, that's the, that's the Thunder City story. And where are you now with it? Um, you're not allowed to fly? Sadly, Mike died. And so the aircraft um, and the, the, the business is in uh, normal estate um, administration. So they're not flying. And whether they'll ever fly again, I don't know. But, it, um, you know, both uh, Mike and I knew that the, the dream would eventually end because our age, you know, I mean, roaring around an air show, it fired Gs again and again and again. Eventually, you know, it starts getting a bit hard on the airframe, the personal airframe. <laughs> so, but still, it's a, it's a, it's a dream that will never die. I mean, it's a, it's a great legacy. You know, we, we often used to pitch ourselves, there we are, private pilots flying this sort of kit. 
um, which was which was wonderful. So lucky. Sure. Um, Ian, thanks very much for your time, man. Uh, it's been very interesting. And are you are you working on any 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 new books? I'm actually writing the um, the Thunder City story. It, it, okay. It's a unique story, so it's right up my street. Um, and I was part of it. So although Mike's gone, um, you know, we spent uh, I don't know thousands of hours together um, chatting about things, and we did things together, ferrying aircraft from Egypt down here, all sorts of things like that. So I've got. Um, it, it is a unique story. It'll never happen again with, with lightnings and buccaneers, especially. And um, yeah, so I'm working on that. It's a really a story about Mike, um, but just free thinking, you know, just, just nobody gets in the way. People say, you can't do something. Mike would say, oh, yes, oh, no, no, not only can I, I will. And that's <laughs> how I managed to launch the business. Fantastic. Well, and wish you, wish you everything of the best. And um, look forward to hooking up with you again soon. Thanks, Anas, and great chatting to you too.